Yeah, the reenactment of myths in American history. That's provocative here on History is Here to Help with history professor Peter Hoffenberg and likewise with our special guest who comes and makes contributions to our discussions, Gene Rosenfeld. Thank you both for showing up today. We are course, so interested you. in this discussion. So Peter, at the risk of doing something you've done before, why don't you introduce Gene Rosenfeld? Well, I've done it before and each time it's a pleasure. I hope to do it in the future. Uh, Dr. Roosevelt, uh, among many things, is a scholar of the history of religions. And among her interests are the relationship between religion, religious ideas, practices, as we'll see today, myths, and political movements, particularly uh, movements of the extreme. Um, what I've read of her is generally of the extreme right. I'm sure she'll have some things to say about the extreme left as well. Uh, but we invite her back as our, our local expert in matters of uh, religion and politics. So Jean, good to see you. Um, I should add that she's a published scholar as well. And I encourage people to Google. She has a superb book about New Zealand and uh, edited and contributed to volumes about uh, terrorism. Okay, okay, now you can define the scope of our discussion, Peter. Oh, no. Okay, I was going to turn to Jean. <laughs> okay, let me just briefly... Uh, suggest the scope, and then I do want to de defer to uh, uh, Jean. There are a lot of discussions, both in and outside of the academy, about how to think about movements like fascism or uh, totalitarianism, but movements we're all familiar with. And there has been, I think, an increasing interest in looking at these as religious movements. Uh, that goes back at least to Rousseau and his concepts of civil religion and all, all modern political thought is a footnote to Rousseau. And uh, Jean in particular is interested in the right and in fascism and the way in which uh, they self-consciously, I assume, although she may decide it's not self-conscious, uh, enact their understanding of the past and uh, reenact their myths. So very exciting, very controversial, and we have exactly the right person to discuss it. So, Gene, you want to do rebuttal on what Peter said? You want to agree or disagree with, with the way he framed it? I'd never disagree with Peter. I'll always learn from Peter. Um, That's a different uh, Peter. <laughs> That's a good That's my twin brother, but thank you. <laughs> it's a difficult segue, but let me just begin by saying that mm -hmm. American history is replete with what is called the Great Awakenings. Mm -hmm. It started before we were a country in New England with Jonathan Edwards, and it continued in New York State in the burnt out district of Northern New York. And then it, 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 today it is happening with an obscure movement, which is becoming much more important uh, in terms of religion and politics. And that is called the New Apostolic Reformation. And there's a, a line that connects all, the, all these dots I'm not going to connect them. It, it's a library of information. I, I'm not fit to do that anyway. Just to let you know that this is nothing new. What, and, and these awakenings are characterized by outbursts of emotion. This is the key word, emotion. And you know what happens when you get emotional? Your thought, process, thought processes, your rational processes turn off. And your emotion takes over. But it's not a, a, a disorganized emotion. It is utilized in ways that religious, I should say, formations or organizations or new religious movements can utilize and take advantage of by employing really sophisticated techniques. And the New Apostolic Reformation does do that. It's located in Texas. There's a church that was just profiled in the news called Mercy Culture. It's got 4,500 adherents and uh, it's spreading throughout the country. Um, it does not have the ball and chain of racism, but it does definitely have overtones of what you would expect in something like The Handmaid's Tale. And they are hell bent, hell bent, heaven bent, <laughs> heaven sent, and basically taking over the political process. As you might imagine, these people were appealed to by Donald Trump. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, just Google his speech to the Miami 
a religious group. Um, I don't have the exact name of it, but it's one of the churches, one of the NAR churches, um, about a year and a half ago, and watch him, um, I don't want to say manipulate, but watch the crowd interaction. He himself is in the tradition as much of Elmer Gantry as he is in the tradition of Benito Mussolini. And you put those two together, and what you get is maybe a once in a lifetime personality that tweaks history. I'm not an aficionado of the great man theory of history, that great men make history. I think rather that history prepare the, the soil for great, quote, great men, men who have an impact. I say men, it's mostly men, it can be a woman, um, who seized the moment. Trump seized the moment. He did this in his inaugural address. His inaugural address is strikingly like the opening paragraphs of a myth, which I think underlies the whole Trumpist phenomenon called the fourth turning. And most people have never heard of it. But it's probably the most efficacious, effective myth that we have today. And it's an apocalyptic myth, of course. But as you read it, you won't understand it as an apocalyptic myth, except it keeps returning to this notion of crisis and total war and revolution and millennial kingdom and prophecy. And the two authors are respected by many people who should know better, historians, economics, professors, and other uh, important people, actually, Neil Howe and William Strauss. And they themselves, I don't think, consciously set out to provide a program for Stephen Bannon, but Stephen Bannon saw the potential. And if you look at a little film that Stephen Bannon made called Generation Zero, it's on the web, you will see how this apocalyptic vision was lifted from the fourth turning and how he lifted the opening chapter of the fourth turning into the inaugural address, which is now loosely called American Carnage. Oh my God. So there's intertwining of our own history of enthusiastic movements, of, um, of new religious movements like NAR, of politics and of all coming together in an administration of a once in a lifetime charismatic leader, you get, uh, you get quite a phenomenon that we've been dealing with. Well, it's terrifying as a matter of fact. Thank you for that. I, I feel no, more terrified than I, I felt you know, 10 minutes ago. Yeah, um, you, look like, you look a lot paler. Don't be yeah. terrified, you know why? <laughs> Don't be terrified, I'll tell you why. Okay. We've been through it before, maybe not as intense because we have more tools at our disposal, the social media and the dark web and all of that. But also because I just recently came to this aha conclusion. Donald Webb is, I mean, Donald Trump is finished. He's a failed charismatic leader. He can never regain the status he had, the influence he had. All of the parts that he brought together, whether it was the extreme right, the neo-Nazi movement, the racist movement, uh, the new apostol apostolic reformation, uh, uh, the far right, whatever, um, the conservatives in the Republican party, you name it, all of those will continue on their own trajectories, but they won't have Donald Trump. Why, what's your analysis? Okay, I was, you know, I've been doing a long-term research project on fascism and Trump, fitting Trump into that. And I uh, was reprising the history of Hitler's rise to power. Now I've never seen Donald Trump as Hitler. Let me just say that. I don't think you see him as Hitler. However, there are some striking parallels in how, what Hitler did to come to power. Most people don't know this, but Hitler was the head of a very powerful party, but it was not a majority party. This is true in fascist movements. They're, they seldom come to power by being uh, the winner of a majority vote. He was given the chancellorship by Chancellor von Hindenburg, who was president of Germany at that time, and the democratic government had already failed by that time. The Reichstag parliament had already been shut down. So Hitler was chancellor, but he didn't have total control and he wanted total control. 
So what he did, to make a long story short, for total control, is he made a secret pact with the military, the army and the navy, and he gave them what they wanted. He had a million man strong army, the SAA, as Sturm Abteilung. And he agreed with them, they could eradicate it. They hit the leaders, the, the leaders on the night of the long knives, the leaders, one of whom was his best friend, Ernst Trump, were assassinated. They were executed. And then Hitler had the army behind him completely, the state army. The second thing is he did, he made a silent pact, a quiet pact on a ship with the leaders of German um, corporations, the big leaders, the titans of industry. And he, in eliminating Ernst Trump, he also eliminated the northern political leader of his own political party, who was a socialist. He, totally wiped out the socialist wing of uh, the National Socialist Democratic Workers Party that he headed. So he consolidated his power with the army behind him, the titans of industry. Now, what did Trump do? He tried to enlist the army during Black Lives Matter. He tried to enlist the army uh, after the election. He failed, our system worked. Then, uh, with respect to the titans of industry, who are the titans today? They're usually the billionaires in social media. And of course, the media, he's got to have because that's his megaphone. And all fascist leaders have to have a megaphone. And they did not, they did not comply. He, he was kicked off Twitter. Twitter and uh, there's begun to be some, some response and control by uh, the heads of the media, and he did not have Silicon Valley behind him. So without the big industrial leaders, without the state army, and then having lost the election, we've forgotten, he actually lost not only the popular vote, but the electoral college. He was reduced to being a subliminal leader, and he can never go back. Now, the thing about charismatic leadership that we've learned from the theorists is that once you can't win, once you fail and are seen to fail, and I'll get back to that in just a minute, you can't, you, you're, you're on a slide. You can't recover from that. That happened to Mussolini. That happened to Napoleon, who are sort of, you know, the, the models for charismatic leader. And of course it happened to Hitler. But the thing was, if you remember when, when Trump got COVID, this is so interesting. He had to look like the virus wasn't going to get him. So even though he was dangerously ill, he insisted on walking to the helicopter. And then he defied his doctors and he went out in the uh, automobile and greeted his supporters to look like he was perfectly okay. He left the hospital too soon. He made that trip up the back stairs and he paused on the portico in that Mussolini pose of his and took off, ripped off his mask and stood there like in Duce. <laughs> that was the moment at which he failed and he could not regain it and he knows it. Now he's reduced to being in his elbows in New Jersey and Florida and his rallies, which can, he can mount an insurrection against the Capitol with his forces but that's weak power. You can never overthrow the American government with something like that. And you know that it stimulated the national security agencies who hated him to go after these guys. And now they're under, uh, they're under pressure that is causing them to break apart. So I think we need to take a deep breath, not fear, know that we're gonna have lots of squabbles and things are gonna go on but without Trump. Well, that's that's a blessing to know that. But at the same time, you know, his legacy is a mess, isn't it? Uh, you know, he undermined so many initiatives. He made so many wrong decisions. Um, and right now, uh, Joe Biden is having a terrible time getting things through, um, you know, fragmented Congress. Um, and the result is we're going to have to live with that legacy for a long time and it is undermining our, our viability, don't you think? Um, I think we'll deal with it. I think things were a mess after the Civil War, pretty bad mess. 
you know, remember Reconstruction, uh, there was an assassination of the president, then Ulysses S. Grant took over, he tried to, and he tried to install Reconstruction, and then Johnson, who was extremely weak, uh, well, he came right after Lincoln. Uh, Johnson was extremely weak, but then U.S. Grant took over. But ultimately, the Southerners won, and uh, we're paying the price for that today. Isn't that true? I mean, those things. Yeah. So, Peter, you, you yes. want to jump in here and, <laughs> and make remarks about what Gene has revealed so far? I think the, the main point that I would suggest, and, and Gene is <coughs> absolutely accurate about uh, Hitler as a fascist leader. And political theorists uh, and historians, religion might focus on Hitler as a charismatic leader. And I can just say it's a complimentary, not a, not a rebuttal, not a uh, criticism, just a complimentary friendly amendment um, that whereas Hitler died, uh, Nazism continues. And whether or not Trump is elect reelected, and I am far less optimistic than Gene is about Trump's possibilities. I, actually see him being reelected. Um, Trumpism exists. So my conversation with Gene is, again, it's, it's a complimentary one. Um, less so the specific political leader, more so the social movement. And yes, Joe Biden won the election, uh, but we still exist with the big lie. And this big lie still exists in Germany about whether or not Germany lost the First World War. So big lies outlast political leaders. Mm -hmm. And as far as the major corporations, uh, we have to remember that this entire big lie campaign, that is, for example, the review of ballots in Arizona, is all being funded by non-tech capitalist giants. This is a very expensive process. I highly recommend you read Jane Meyer's piece in The New Yorker last week where she pulls uh, really the, the carpet from under this, she reveals that uh, big money is behind this. And we're dealing with big money that can manipulate and exploit social values. So for example, whether or not Trump wins, we quite clearly see a revived anti-abortion movement. Whether or not Trump wins, We've, we see more people buying guns than ever before. So as a social historian, I mean, Gene and I are friends. And we have, this is what academics do, right? We fundamentally agree, <laughs> we, but we have just a different point of entry, right? So everything Gene said, I, I completely agree with. I learned a lot. My concern would be with the ism, though, not necessarily the leader. And I think, let me just finish that one of the myths which we still live with in the United States, and we are going to live with it again in Afghanistan, is that we could have militarily won the war. And I think that the consequences, and I don't agree with that, that's a myth, that's a, that's a myth which is no fabrication reality, US, unless US were going to turn to nuclear weapons, which it wasn't going to do. But the sense of, a military victory that eluded one, right? Destroyed France with the Dreyfus Affair, led to the rise of Nazism. And when you look closely at the right and its sense of toxic masculinity, its gun wielding, its unbelievable anti-Asian sentiment, they very much have in their collective psyche the Vietnam War. And I fear that we're going to redo that when people start thinking about Afghanistan as well. Well, uh, Gene, I want to talk about more about myths. What is a myth? What is a national myth? And what is the, the you know, the verb to reenact? What does that mean? And uh, how is that playing with us? And I, you know, I, I uh, only from you, I heard about the fourth turning and Steve Bannon and all that. What What is that myth? Is this all kind of an expression of American exceptionalism, uh, or is it more or less, what are the myths we have to cope with, you know, to, to get rational, if you will, going forward? Well, again, I'm going from theory, uh, you know, heuristic 
useful theory uh, scholarship. Um, how to put it? Um, every viable nation, and not every nation is a state. We talk about a nation state. A nation is a group of people who have in common a language, a territory, and a history. And even though they may come from other shores, they buy into it. E pluribus unum is what we've got. That's a very succinct uh, phrase that describes our national myth. Out of many, one. That's our aspiration as a nation as well, as Michelle Obama knows. The mythology of the United States has a lot to do with what we learned in school. But now we're learning that what we learned in school wasn't the whole story. And why are we learning that now? Because the tables are beginning to turn. There's a big demographic revolution. Remember at Charlottesville, the refrain was, Jews will not replace us. Well, you could put blacks, you can put Hispanics, you can put whatever you want. The whole theory is called the great replacement theory, which is embraced by the far right and the racist right. And the fact is that the United States is becoming browner, you know? And we're intermarrying. And all you have to do is look at the commercials on your TV. So this is the time when the national myth of the Puritans and the Christians founding America is being contested. And other founding stories are coming in. It's 1619 with the black slave ships coming in for the first time. But it could be the Acadians from Louisiana. It could be the Hawaiians with their founding myth. It could be the Spanish in California. You know, we all have founding myths because that's what binds us together in our civic religion. You really can't separate religion and politics as it comes down to it because that's what we all buy into and that's what keeps us together. Okay? So these chaotic elements that Peter has given us a litany of, and I totally agree with Peter, they're gonna go on. And they were, they were already going on before Trump was president. He took advantage of them. He's a good con man. He's a good Elmer Gantry. He can rev up the troops. He knows how to put it all together. And it's all about him. But it's all about him because he's the embodiment of them. And they buy into that. Go back and read the inaugural address. That will show you that. The fourth turning. The fourth turning is <laughs> a wonderfully seductive systemic notion that there are cycles in history, that history does not progress, that civilization does not progress. Rather, we're based on the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. And by the way, oh my goodness, that's human life, isn't it? Childhood, adulthood, maturity, and old age, okay? So they take this quad, quadruple construction, and they give it a history and a scholarship, which it, you can really contest. It's very inconsistent and it's not very accurate, but it really comes across strong. And Steve Bannon was attracted, why? Because they say that history is divided into these cycles of four 20 year units and the whole 80 year cycles called the seculum, which is like a human lifetime or a year. And what, what this means is that each part of that is characterized by historical events, culminating in a catastrophe in the fourth turning. The fourth quadrant brings about a challenge to its generation who are called heroes in a way that nothing else in history has. And they go back and they completely schematize British and American history for 500 years to prove that this is true. They don't do it for the world though. They don't do it for China. They only do it for the history they know when we're taught in school. And the fact is they now see a fourth turning from 2005 to 2025, calling forth the heroes. And it's gonna be even more intense than the other ones. And what were the other ones? Well, the last one we had was Second World War and the Depression. And previous to that, you know, the Civil War. What they don't include, though, are some other very important things that any historian would include, like the First World War. 
because it doesn't fit their schema. So the whole thing is clever, but it's not very smart. But people buy into it. But what, they, what Bannon has bought into is that we're in precipitous decline. All the things that the litany that Peter set forth can make you feel very down. But in fact, if you read history and you get a broader view, you see it's happened be before, not the same thing. History doesn't repeat itself in the specifics. There are patterns, but this is not the pattern, not the cyclical thing. We do have a linear history. We don't have a cyclical. So cyclical what is the difference history? between a, a, a relive and a reenactment? Okay, if you, this is the best thing I can use to explain it. I was struck by it when I saw the videos of January 6th. I, of course, I was struck by everything, but the thing that focused my attention where they were costumed and they were carrying flags and they would have logos on their shirts. It reminded me of what happens in all the little towns in the summertime in the United States, in the heartland and in the east part in the small towns. These are historical reenactments. Re Everywhere you stand in the United States, there's a history. You know, Barbara Fritchie or the Green Mountain Boys or you name it. And the towns reenact them. And there are people who are do this. This is, this is what they do. This is their avocation. When they're not working, they reenact. Well, that's very interesting because they're all about the myths, the founding myths of these little towns. Everything has to have a founding myth. This is a religious principle, by the way. And so they reenact them and they brings up the emotions, the feelings, and it binds the, the audience together in its mind. I'll give you another example. When Trump celebrated July 4th and he went to um, you know, the, the mountain with all the presidents on it, and then the next day he was at the White House, what did he talk about? He talked about the United States white man's founding myth. You know, and and when when he had his um, acceptance of his candidacy in the second election, everybody got up and testified. They testified to that myth. Okay. And 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 anytime you try to change that myth, like Gary Nash did in the 1990s with a whole bunch of national historians and include some of the people who founded Los Angeles, who, none of whom were white, by the way, and other such things are the 1619. That's a challenge that has to be beaten down because that's not the myth. But this reenactment revives a sense of, of belonging, finding uh, civic religion and patriotism in the, in the generic sense of the word. Well, they're not particularly healthy then, these myths, and the reenactment isn't particularly healthy. So where does it all go? Do we need new myths? Do we need to debunk old ones? Do we need to stop reenacting them? We don't do anything with myths. Myths are something that arise from people out of their living. It's, it's something human beings do. They, they have to explain how things came into being. How did this happen? There's a founding story. In, in Israel, it's Masada you know, the heroes at Masada. Here it's the heroes of the revolution and, and the Tea Party and all of that. So every people has to have it. It's not negative. It's, it can be very positive and binding, but it can be negative if it becomes exclusive and racist and just generally. So it can be interpreted, reinterpreted, yeah. misinterpreted, and sure. people will follow it. They will reenact inaccurately the true original founding myth. No, there's no true original founding in mythology. Mythology is truth, but on a different plane from history. Myth and history are two separate phenomena. Myth is something that gives meaning to your life, and it's true. I mean, people do Bible study, they do Torah study, they, you know, who, who disbelieves that the gospels and what they convey, what they convey is more than history can ever convey to a person. It's values, it's belonging, it's a truth of a different order. 
okay? And it answers different questions. So we shouldn't try to mix the two. Okay, well, Peter, let me turn to you. <clears throat> this is something that uh, Professor uh, Sandy Schwartz has discussed, <laughs> and that is, you know, every empire, um, so far as we know in the world, and certainly in the discipline of history, has ultimately come to an end. Like every bacterial colony we know, ultimately comes to an end. So the question is, where, where does that fit uh, in terms of the, um, what is it, the fourth turning, in terms of the various factors that you and Jean have been talking about? As far as whether an empire is going to survive as an American power? I'm not quite sure what you're asking me, sorry. That, that's it. Okay, so um, I think the uh, jury is out on the Chinese empire. It certainly hasn't declined and that may be the next major empire. Um, I'm not convinced uh, of the US having an empire in the traditional sense of an empire. But if, it, if the empire is uh, exercising overseas influence, the US will continue to exercise overseas influence, if that's the question you're asking. Um, most uh, empires have a great difficulty reconciling uh, domestic and overseas values. This is what the ancient world called imperium et libertas. There is no empire in history whose exercise of foreign power has not sacrificed domestic freedom. We live in that today, right? Uh, the war against terror is a good example. Uh, the fact that the United States turns to Pacific Islands for military recruiting Right, and none of those kids get a chance to vote. They don't have citizenship. So I would, to answer your question, is if the U.S. continues this kind of overseas intervention, whatever, you, if you want to call it an empire or not, it will continue to deny domestic freedoms. Now, as far as the uh, reenactment, I, I love Gene's description. Um, there is an excellent book about Civil War reenactments. A wonderful book in which the person embedded themselves with the reenactors. And um, whereas I entirely agree with the notion of a myth, uh, there's some other things going on there as well. There's a tremendous amount of masculinity in these myths and the way they're reenacted. And what worries me, um, I, I don't mind the small village reenactment, but I think January 6th is different because this was reenactment with live ammunition and reenactment with the intentional intent of violence. Most of the small reenactments, even the Civil War reenactments, the, the exercise is in fact not to be violent. So something else is going on here. With, and you know my concern about militarism and violence. And that, that worries me a tremendous amount. So I don't equate January 6th uh, with folks in Ohio uh, going out, walking hey, around a little bit. Hold, hold, yes. hold there, Gene. Gene yeah. would like to uh, interpose. I totally yes. agree. There's the reenactment that we talked about where they wear the Revolutionary War costume. Right, or the Civil War uniforms, right. That does not characterize January 6th. Right. January 6th is what I call an enactment of okay. myth. And the type of myth they're enacting, they're very open about it's the apocalypse. It's Goddard Donoran. It's uh, the revolution that they want to set off. Tim McVeigh tried revolution by bombing Oklahoma City. The right wing is full of revolution, and their model, of course, is the Turner Diaries. Absolutely. It's some of the so water this, water this water was water. an attempt yeah. to stimulate a revolution, not only by attacking the Capitol, but remember the fears we had that every state capital was going to have the same thing. Right. So do, you believe, do you believe, Gene, that we will have a revolution? And if we have a revolution by virtue of these reenactments, um, will, will that threaten the future existence of the American empire? I am not in the business of prediction. Unlike Strauss and Howe, who call their work a history, but admit that they are prophets. I am not a prophet and no historian would ever <laughs> sink to that. But all we can well, say maybe. is, all we, 
<laughs> we can say maybe Peter's an exception. <laughs> but I, so I'm, I happily sing. Don't worry, I'm, I'm happy to sing. <laughs> we can only look at what's happening, and having the background of the past can be calming. It can also be instructive. But this I will offer: history always surprises. We never know what's around the corner. If you were to ask me personally, what I think. I would say, give it 10 years, maybe, maybe a little more. It won't matter. It won't matter why. We have a bigger climate. crisis, the climate, climate crisis. crisis. And that is going to have such incredible fallout on politics and, and, and what happens internationally and what happens locally. I mean, it's when it happens locally and it happens internationally, people finally get it. And this is going to cause Habit. That's a whole new discussion, but I, I that is right. absolutely yeah. overarching yeah, two, point. But the two are so, absolutely linked. The two, two are absolutely, absolutely linked. Yes, they are. Yeah. They really be. Yeah. And you don't even need to be grandiose and existentialist. Uh, they're linked around much of the world as far as far as access to fresh water. That's going to, I mean, water access to water is the crucial strategic issue. Change everything. So, Peter, um, wow, what a discussion we have. Gone from pillar to post on this one. Uh, I'm, gotta I'm do it again. Gotta get Gene course, back. Do it again. Gene has to yeah. come back. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so Peter, can you can you take a moment and summarize and uh, and um, you know close the show? I will. I will try to summarize. Gene left us with uh, a lot. Um, if I had say three points, and and Samuel Johnson always said to focus on three points. Uh, Dr. Roosevelt suggested the power of uh, a text the reading of the fourth turning to generate a, a mythic reality, or as she would say, a mythic truth. And that that seems to have been spreading and seems to have enabled uh, the former president of the United States to make up a, a populist link. Uh, that would be one, one takeaway for sure. Uh, secondly, uh, Gene's important comment that uh, all communities and all nations have something we would call a myth, but that it's not a but. And that myth is a particular view of the past, which should be distinct from the historical past. So as she concludes, it really doesn't do much good to try to punch holes in myths based on history. They're, they're different enterprises, okay? And the third, I guess, conclusion would be we need to discuss this even further and I would like to see uh, her comments uh, and discuss the connections with the political left. Because a lot of what she suggested can be applied also to the political left. Uh, and I say that in a loving term, as you know, so it's not a derogatory term, but if we look at the nature of myth and, and political movements as religious movements, we could also, I think, have a very fruitful discussion discussing the role on the left. And we will. My final, my final point for you is that I do worry not about an organized revolution, but in a country where every 17 year old can get an AR-15, I do worry about violence and violence connected to what might be perceived as a revolution and I think we all have the stark point of data of a young white kid going into a church, worshiping for several hours, murdering everybody in that church and telling the police that he wanted to restart the civil war. So it's not as if the entire South is gonna come into warfare, but, and I'm sure Gene knows from religion and myth, there are copycatters, right? There are, lone wolves that aren't really lone wolves. So I'm gonna leave you with a depressing point, which will make you even paler than you are now. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure. I, wor I worry about the violence in this country. I worry a great deal about the violence. Well, this is always encouraging. Um, you know, you. And, and all, all of our <laughs> that's shows, my, that's all, my of our shows lead, lead, all of our shows lead to other shows. You cannot uh, so ask. You, you, have, you have left um, traces on the ground for us to follow in the next discussion. You and your audience cannot ask a German, Jewish, European historian to break into Groucho Marx. It ain't gonna happen. You know me, okay? We know Sorry that. about that. 
And if we know two really gives us some optimism. I I have to be a little more skeptical. Okay. We know two things that we have learned. Um, history is here to help, and also, may I say, history is full of surprises. <laughs> yeah. And history Thanks. sometimes history sometimes cannot help. Uh, Thank you, Peter. As we got to go. We got to go. Said. All right, we'll talk about Peter Hoffenberg and, and Gene Rosenfeld. Thank, Thank you so you, much, both of Thanks, you, Gene. for joining us today. We'll do this again, Thank of you. course. Aloha.